Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the gathering of Denison Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to begin focusing uh, our, our hearts and our minds on God's word. That's how we're going to begin worship today. So if you would, look at the beginning of John, 1 John chapter 1 with me as I read this. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and what have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Well, after the DBC Life meeting this past uh, week, a few of us were talking about a couple of YouTube channels, of all things, uh, as just that, that covered archaeological digs and people who go and explore sites from the Old Testament. And uh, it's amazing to me. You know, we, we read these stories about places like the Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel. We, we read about the walls falling down around the city of Jericho. Uh, we read about the people of God crossing the Red Sea on dry land. And these things, they, they, bec they become kind of normal to us because we read them. They're part of our faith, uh, faith tradition. But to see these things documented and people actually walk in these places, it, it, it shouldn't astonish us, but it, it does. It's easy for us to become inoculated to these things. So as we gather today, let's remember that we have a faith that's been passed down by real people, that Jesus actually walked the earth, that he actually did have disciples who followed him, who did go on to pass their faith on to other people all over the world, who did for generation after generation after generation pass on the gospel to others all the way to us today. The message we have is clear, that Jesus Christ came into the world to bring salvation, to bring hope. And we know that that's true today because of the faithful witness of those who've gone before us. Many of those who went before us paid the price with their life to do so. So even here in our passage today, you see the testimony of this. In verse 3 of our passage, it says, What we have seen and what we have heard, we declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us. We have seen him. I've seen him. I, I, I touched him. I walked with him. I, I listened to I heard his voice with my ears. I was around him while he was eating, and I was eating. We were sharing meals together. I have seen it, and I'm passing it on to you. They passed on the truth of what they learned to others. As we gather here today, let's not do so complacently. Let's not take for granted the precious truth that we hold fast to. 
Even now, let the fact that we have a living faith in Jesus stir your heart, stir your mind, lift your gaze to the one who deserves our worship. Just like those earliest disciples and all those who followed them until today, we too have been changed by Christ Jesus. Even if it's not in the same sense of being sitting in his physical presence and his literal hearing and his proximity so we can hear him in the flesh, we have seen how gracious he is. We've experienced his compassion, his love, and his mercy. As he's worked in our hearts and in the lives of those around us, we too can say we observed his glory, like John 1 says, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So remind your heart of this today. Let that message meet you right where you are today. Jesus, the one who became flesh, who took on our flesh, dwelt among us, has revealed himself to us. The living word has now given us the written word so that we can know that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. The one who's full of grace and truth is the one who beckons us to gather as one people here in this place to make much of him together as a church family. So let's sing. Let's pray. Let's engage with God's word this morning because he's worthy of our praise. Jesus is truly alive. Death has been defeated through the work of Christ. Our sin is no more. We praise the one who has given us true life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the reminder that you are the living God and you are the, the only true God. There is no other God but you. Thank you for the reminder this morning that Jesus actually did enter into time, take on flesh, live a human experience, and die a, a, a horrific death in our place. Thank you for the reminder that people actually did follow you, Jesus. They actually did pass their faith on for generations all the way to us. So today, stir our hearts. Help us to lift our gaze to you. Help us to remind ourselves of what's most important in this life, not to be distracted by the cares of this world, the toils of this world, the circumstances we find ourselves in, but help us today to focus on you, the one true God. You are worthy of our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together as we sing.
washed by his blood. Come and rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on Him. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. 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 He shall return. He shall return in power to reign. say, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, then who shall fall on bend in me, all creatures of our God and King. from the scriptures together. This was taken from a few different places in the book of Revelation, and, uh, but it's a declaration of God's people to the king, to Jesus, as they stand before the throne. So can we read this? This will be on the screen together. This is right from Revelation 19, I think from chapter 5. It says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Hallelujah. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and glory and power forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. And this morning we want to teach you a song. We sent this out on the WhatsApp this week, but if you didn't have a chance to go over it, it is simply a declaration of what we believe in our faith, that I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Spirit. I believe there's one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe the name of Jesus Christ. Let's sing this chorus together. We want to teach that to you. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and salvation, one door that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is dead. to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King. 
king who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing place for me, far beyond what hearts imagine, ears I've heard or eyes I've seen. I believe that a day is coming, he's returning to claim his bride. Hide the altar, keep it burning, see the Lamb who rose a roaring lion. All praise to God the all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name. Christ, how could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Sing that again. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? I'll never be. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All praise, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore mighty name I believe what gift of
This morning, we're going to worship through giving, so you can do that in, per uh, in person as the bucket comes around, or if it's more convenient for you, you can do that online, and we have a QR code there if that's helpful for you. It takes you right to where you can do that online, so um, at this time, we'll worship through giving as we continue singing. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the forever to the King. 
Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old, it shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, and God of glory, majesty, and praise forever to the King of kings, and praise forever. Yes, Lord, we praise your name today, Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are the Lord of all, that you are the King of kings, that you alone are worthy of worship and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. It's to that name today that we bow. It's to that name today that we surrender, that we give our hearts and our lives to, that we yield dreams and hopes. So, Lord, we come under you today. We come under your authority and the authority of your word as we pray and as we engage with your word, as we, the children go to Sunday Club. Lord, may you be the one who rules and reigns in our hearts and our lives. So we say we give you our hearts freely, willingly take all of us. That's where our truest, deepest joy is found. It's in total surrender submission to you. In Jesus' name, we sing these songs today. Amen. You can be seated. This time all our children can go to Sunday Club. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we've got announcements just now, and then we're going to move into a time of prayer. Uh, so the announcements are just going to be on the screen behind me. Uh, I've got an easy job this week because we've got a reduced schedule. Um, our normal outreach activities aren't on this week, uh, so no football, no ESOL. Uh, but we will still have Tuesday prayer. Uh, so if you guys can make uh, make it down for that, put it in your diaries. It'll be at 7:30 at the church. Uh, so Tuesday at 7.30 for prayer. Uh, Thursday, missional communities will be on again as usual. Um, if you're not connected with a missional community and want to be, then speak to Mark or TJ or to Claire and we can organize that for you. Uh, and then Friday, that early morning prayer is still on. That still made it into the schedule. Uh, so come down at 7.30 to Starbucks at, at the Forge if you can make it. Okay, it's at 7, so don't turn up at 7.30. <laughs> um, and then again, uh, we'll be back here on Sunday uh, to worship. Um, next Sunday night, there's the 3 two, one course. Uh, so it's designed for non-Christians. It's uh, designed as an outreach. Uh, so if you would like to come along, then feel free. Uh, but if you can bring somebody who doesn't know uh, the Lord, then please uh, bring them along with you as well. Uh, so just be praying as well this week for that. Uh, one for anybody that you know, and just if anybody else is bringing anybody along, uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, as well, the Quest team is coming on Friday. Um, so pray for safe travels for them as they come. Um, and I'm sure you'll see more on Sunday. Um, and just introduce yourselves and encourage them um, as they come to Christ. Uh, perfect. So that's all the announcements. Uh, we're just going to move into a time of prayer just now. Um, 
In this morning's prayer slot, I just wanted to take some time uh, to pray over some aspects of the membership covenant that we looked at last week. Um, so there'll be some slides just from uh, Mark's sermon last week on the screen behind us. And we won't have time to go through them all, uh, but I've just highlighted a few of them. Uh, so the first two that we're going to look at is number two. Uh, and it reads, we center everything on the word of God. No worries. Uh, so that's the first point. We center everything on the word of God. Uh, and then the second one is number six. We see all life as worship. Uh, so last week, Mark took us through our membership covenant, uh, what we as a church value. Uh, and I just wanted to spend some time praying over uh, these aspects of the membership covenant. Um, the men in the church at the moment are reading through Leviticus as part of our daily devotionals. And we just read the story of Nahab and Abihu. Um, and this account shows Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, attempting to come before the Lord in a way that he hadn't instructed. And we see the devastating consequences of that. Uh, I do have that, TJ, that um, passage in Leviticus 10. Uh, and the Lord makes an example of Nahab and Abihu because they, priests, uh, God's representatives, arrogantly thought that they knew better. Um, it's on the screen behind us. It says, Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, each took his own fire pan, put fire in it, placed incense on it, and presented unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. Then fire came down from the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Um, and this acts as a cautionary tale to us, uh, as the church collectively and as, as individuals, uh, because we are now God's representatives. Uh, the Lord has told us how we are to approach him and how we are to represent him in the word, uh, through his word. And the Lord will not bless us, the church, um, but rather he might deal heavily with us if we arrogantly think that we know best. So my prayer at this time would be that we ask the Lord to give us a heart for his word collectively and individually, and to give thanks that God has given DBC uh, godly leaders who value the word of God and who lead us in those ways. Uh, so if you want to take just a couple of minutes to pray for those, uh, first that we would seek God's word and to give thanks for our leaders, and then I'll pray. Uh, dear Lord, we come before you and we ask you to give us a heart for your word. Uh, Lord, help us to value your word and to see it for what it is. Uh, Lord, we can see instances in your word when we don't uh, correctly revere your commands that uh, devastating consequences can happen. Uh, Lord, we as your church here in Deniston wish to uphold your word and uphold your commands. Uh, and we wish to see the blessings that come as a result of that and not the judgment um, that comes from not following correctly. Uh, Lord, as well, we thank you for TJ and for Mark, um, for who you've given us as elders, that they do prize the word of God, Lord, uh, and that they do lead us in these directions. Lord, we recognize not every church has this, and we see this as a blessing from you. Uh, so, Lord, we just want to give you thanks just now uh, for TJ and for Mark and for the way that they lead the church. Uh, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the second point of our membership covenant that I want to look at uh, comes from 3 and 9. It says, we are in love with the person and work of Jesus. And 9 says, we know we're not the finished article. We need grace. Uh, so as we continue in Leviticus, um, after verse 10, after chapter 10, sorry, we're about to read passages, uh, pages and pages of regulation that the nation of Israel were to observe for ceremonial cleanness. Uh, this was necessary to allow the people to come into the presence of the Lord. Uh, and Leviticus, after giving these commands, continually repeats the phrase, you must be holy because I am holy. So my next uh, prayer point is to give thanks for the person and work of Jesus. Uh, give thanks that because we have access to the presence of God through Jesus, because he is holy, not because we are holy. We have this position before God that he sees us as holy. Uh, yet this positional holiness um, doesn't mean that we're not going to sin. 
So pray for God's grace to overcome. Uh, my two prayers then in this section is uh, give thanks for Jesus, that he's given us holiness, uh, and also pray that we can overcome sin. So I'll give you guys the time and then I'll pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the person and work of Jesus. Lord, we saw from the Old Testament uh, how many rules and regulations there were to follow in order to have ceremonial cleanness before you, Lord. Uh, and we see from Leviticus that we were to do this. Uh, we are to be holy, Lord, because you are holy. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are holy because Jesus is holy. Lord, we thank you that he has come and that he has died and that he has paid that ultimate sacrifice for us and that we can be in your presence unlike any uh, Israelite would have known before Christ, Lord. We thank you for this intimate relationship. Uh, we thank you for the work that Jesus has done. We thank you as well for the person of Jesus. We thank you for his character. Uh, we thank you for uh, the goodness that, that is Jesus, Lord. Uh, as well, we pray, uh, we recognize that this isn't a prerequisite for uh, a sinless life. We recognize, Lord, that we will still sin. Lord, help us to overcome in these times. Uh, help us to look to Jesus, to see what he's done for us, and uh, in the strength to overcome whatever we're facing, Lord. Uh, Lord, we recognize that this is your grace. Um, as a church and uh, individually, Lord, um, bestow this grace upon us. Again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, and then just finally, we're going to uh, read number 10 of the membership covenant. Uh, and it says, we realize we cannot remain healthy unless we grow. Uh, and growth is not numerical, but is in these things that we've just looked at. Uh, so pray uh, as a church that we recognize the collective and individual responsibility uh, for growth. So growth individually, but also our responsibility to one another to encourage growth, uh, to disciple one another uh, and to encourage growth. So we'll just pray for that just now. And then I'll close. given us the church, uh, universal and here at DBC. Uh, Lord, thank you that the church is made up of like-minded individuals, of people who have been saved by grace, Lord. Uh, thank you that you've put us together and that we can encourage one another uh, in this walk, Lord, in this life. Uh, we recognize it as a gift from you. Um, Lord, help us individually to be focused on personal growth, uh, devotion to you, um, growing in the things of you, Lord, uh, and that through this we can be an encouragement to one another, uh, that we can disciple one another, uh, we can come alongside each other when things are possibly difficult for, uh, for each of us. Uh, Lord, help us to do this, help us to be loving to, to one another in, in the strength that you give, Lord, not in our own strength. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. prayer for us in 2024 uh, through this book is that we would be transformed, uh, changed, 
uh, by what it is we spend time looking at uh, through this book. Uh, I was preparing for this message this morning and I was really struck uh, by this quote from Kent Hughes and his commentary in Ephesians. Uh, Kent Hughes wrote this and it's just something that I want us to hold on to as we think about not only this morning but also this entire series over 2024. Uh, so he says, Ephesians, uh, carefully, reverently, prayerfully considered, will change our lives. It is not so much a question of what we will do with the epistle, but what it will do with us. Uh, and as we begin this series, that's been my prayer. Uh, that the book of Ephesians would righteously wreck us and bring us to that healthy place of greater reliance on Christ. That's my hope for us as we go through this series. And we've titled this series Reconciled because this is um, one of, if not the central themes within this letter. Um, and it's central in a sense that reconciliation that Paul speaks of throughout this letter, as we spoke about on Wednesday, is, is vertical. Uh, reconciliation with God. Paul writes to Ephesians and he speaks about what it means to be fully reconciled back to God and the impact that has on every single believer who's in Christ. And it's central in a sense that reconciliation that Paul speaks about is also horizontal. So there's vertical and there's also horizontal reconciliation. God gave us reconciliation with him in order that we might be reconciled to one another as God's family. Uh, and this has a profound impact on how we relate to one another within the church um, and what we think and what we say and what we do uh, towards those who sit beside us right now, this morning. Uh, God also gave us reconciliation with him alongside this in order that we might be an agency of reconciliation to a lost world. So as we think about the community we live in, there are so many folk who are lost, who are far from Christ. Uh, and God has given us the opportunity to reconcile them back to Christ through our personal witness. Uh, and this is something that we should be tremendously excited about when it comes to the book of Ephesians. Uh, as we think about how God reconciles us back to himself, but also reconciles us as a church family. And he also reconciles us in the sense that he can use us to connect others back to Christ or to Christ for the first time, we should be excited by that. What a tremendous prospect we have as God's people. It's incredible enough that God has reconciled us to himself, that the fact that we now have what Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 5.18, the ministry of reconciliation. What a privilege. Uh, this is something that we should rejoice in and live by day to day. God in Christ has made our lives worth living because of this reconciliation. Amen. Good news. Um, so if you love Jesus this morning, my challenge to you, when you wake up tomorrow, the first thing I invite you to do, before you go on your phone, uh, before whatever it is you do, first thing uh, on a Monday morning, is to say to yourself, I am reconciled. I am reconciled. And just let that sink in for a moment. Let that truth become central. And the fact that God has made you right with him because God loves you and God cares for you and he will never, ever let you go. He will never let you go. That's worth reminding yourself first thing in the morning, is it not? That's worth focusing on first thing on Monday. And as you let that truth that you have been reconciled to Christ marinate in your heart, I would also invite you to remind yourself that alongside the fact that you have been reconciled, you've been given a purpose. Uh, and so as you wake up and declare to yourself that you have been reconciled, also declare these words to yourself. I am a reconciler. I'm a reconciler. And surely the fact that we have been reconciled to be a reconciler is why God gave us our lives. This is our purpose. God has reconciled us so that we can then reconcile other people back to Christ. And the moment we take our focus off of that is a moment we will find the Christian life difficult, confusing, meaningless, overwhelming. The Apostle Paul understood this because this is exactly what happened to him on the road to Damascus. Uh, Jesus appeared to him in a vision. He fell to the ground. He was blind. And we discover why God saved Paul through the testimony of Ananias. The Lord said to Ananias, 
speaking of Paul, this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. In other words, I've reconciled him in order that he might be a reconciler to the Gentiles, to kings, to the Jews. One of the ways that, that Paul fulfilled this missionary call from God was by spending two years in Ephesus. So Paul was writing to the Ephesians, but he had already spent two years in this city. And in Acts 19, we see how Paul lived amongst the Ephesians. He discipled the church. The, he witnessed to the city. He reasoned from the scriptures. He wrote his first letter to the Corinthian church when he was in Ephesus. And commentators will note that when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, because a wide door for effective ministry has opened for me, yet many oppose me, he was most likely probably speaking about his witness, his opportunity as he was in Ephesus. So Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians when he was in Ephesus, uh, and Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians when he was probably in prison in Rome around AD 60 to 62. And we can be confident of this because on three occasions in this letter in Ephesians, Ephesians 3.1, Ephesians 4.1, Ephesians 6.20, he describes himself as being in prison. So he speaks of, of his own current circumstances. So it's clear that something is going on within the life of Paul. Paul is in prison most likely. And we can be confident of this because he continues to encourage in the midst of hardship throughout this letter. And it didn't change the fact that he loved these Ephesian brothers and sisters. And Acts 19 shows us that. He had a strong relationship with these Ephesians. His two years with these Ephesian brothers and sisters meant that he and them were family. There was a bond of, of love. There was a deep connection between Paul and the Ephesian church. And the Ephesian church were displaying the fruit of this personal investment. Over time, they started to see how God had used the Apostle Paul. And I say that because of, because of the Apostle John. And, and John shows us in Revelation chapter 2 that the Ephesian church were a faithful church. They were known for their works, for their labor, for their endurance, for their determination not to tolerate evil, for their discerning truth from false, for their perseverance. So it's an argument from silence, but I'm fairly confident that Paul's godly counsel and investment had something to do with what we see in Revelation chapter 2 and John's testimony. And I love that. I love how Paul just spent two years in Ephesus. And how cool it would be if, if Paul came and visited Denison for a couple of years and just said, I'm going to give you two years of my time living in the east end of Glasgow, pastorally discipling us as a church family, hanging out in Tebow, sharing his faith, contending from the scriptures, and then after two years, he was off. And just the impact that would have on us as a church family. So the Ephesians were blessed by this. And Paul knew the Ephesian church. And he knew the city of Ephesus because he was there. He was present. And it's so important as we come to understand this letter. Paul was deeply familiar with this context. And Ephesus as a city was characterized, defined by two things. Economic prosperity and idolatry, economic prosperity and idolatry. If you go on holiday to Turkey, you're on the west coast of Turkey, you can actually visit uh, the city of Ephesus. It has one of the seven wonders of the world, the great temple of Artemis, the mother goddess and patron of the city. And every year the people of Ephesus would pay homage to this goddess, which in effect is a demon. And they had this elaborate procession throughout the town. And you would be amazed at how similar this kind of thing was to other kinds of processions you might see in Glasgow today. Uh, they believed that if they honored the goddess Artemis, then the prosperity of the city would be guaranteed through the favor of this particular goddess. And for a time, the Ephesian people believed that it worked because Ephesus was wealthy. The Ephesians were loaded. It was described as one of, the, one of the most precious jewels in the empire's crown. And it was a highly cultured, highly sophist sophisticated place to live. And as, as a people, they wrapped their identity around not only money, but around this goddess they worshipped. So 
there was no need for the gospel amongst the Ephesians. Why would anyone turn to Jesus? In that kind of context, they had everything, did they not? Well, such is the power of the gospel because people were getting saved in Ephesus. They had all this stuff. They worshipped Artemis and yet people were coming to Christ. People were getting baptized in Ephesus. Churches were being planted from Ephesus. People were seeing the folly of wrapping their identity around money and around this God, this false God. And they were turning to Jesus. They were putting their faith and hope in him. And as we read in Acts 19 and verses 18 to 20, it'll be up on the screen for us. We read this, speaking of Ephesus, many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. While many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. And I'm confident that this occurred beyond the time of Paul for many years to come. God was on the move in a city and the smell of burning magic books was testimony to what God was doing amongst these people. So if that was a spiritual condition of Ephesus and God moved mightily amongst them, what about Glasgow? Think about our city for a moment. Check the spiritual condition of this city. Uh, what is it that God could do within us, through us as a church in one year, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 and 50 years? You might hear me say this and you might carry in your heart, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but this or yeah, but that. That might be a kind of mentality. Yeah, but I can't be used by God amongst my neighbors or in my workplace or with my friends, or here in Deniston, or here in Glasgow because of this reason, or that reason, or these reasons. But if anyone was justified in having an excuse to not be used by God, it was the Apostle Paul. First of all, look at who he was. Paul, historically, was the anti-Christian. He was a persecutor of believers. And Paul had so much to overcome before he could reach others with the gospel. And secondly, as we read this letter to the Ephesians, look at where Paul was. Paul was in prison. So if there was anyone who could say, I can't be used by God, it would be Paul. Yet he remained faithful to fulfilling the great command. He loved God. He loved people. Having been reconciled, he sought to be a reconciler. And during his time in prison, he writes to the Ephesians. It's been described um, as the divinest, composition of man, the book of Ephesians. I mean, there's, there's so many memorable phrases, so many memorable sentences. We can all recognize this. We can think immediately of a, of a famous phrase or sentence that comes from this book. And this morning, what we're going to do is simply focus on the first two verses of this letter. And by Easter, we will have finished chapter one, which is pretty good going because there's so much for us to look at within this first chapter in the book of Ephesians. And what we see from these first two verses at first glance, uh, what you might understand in effect is a simple greeting from Paul to the Ephesians. But as we dig into it a little bit more, we will see there's so much theological truth to learn and so much theological truth for us to apply to our lives. And the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 1, and verses 1 to 2, and I'm reading from the CSB, Paul says this. It's a very simple greeting, a well-known greeting from Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but within our Christian subculture, uh, we can often find ourselves uh, veering away from authenticity. I think that's a challenge constantly within church in the West. I'm not primarily speaking about Denison Baptist Church. I'm not excluding DBC from that equation either. There can be a smell, there can be a whiff, there can be a stench of being inauthentic with the wider Christian church in the West. Uh, what I mean by that is, 
it can be very easy for us to present ourselves on a Sunday or on social media or on WhatsApp. We can present ourselves in a particular way. And all the while, something else is going on. Um, how we present ourselves can often not be reflective of what we think about others and what we think about ourselves. And in doing that, we can often be the opposite of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So we lack the genuine love for God and we lack the genuine love for other people that is so evident within this letter. And this can be true for how we present ourselves as individuals, but it can also be true for how we present ourselves as a church collectively. So we can, we can kind of present, have this facade that we are one way, but deep down we are actually another way. And when you live in that kind of fake Western culture for long enough, you start to look at what you read in Scripture, or you can look at what you read in Scripture through that particular lens, to the point that you might look at what Paul writes in these two verses, and you might think Paul is using fancy religious language here, but the truth of the matter is he's just saying hello. That's all he's doing. He's using all these kind of fancy theological terms, but in reality, he's just saying all righty. Hello. And you might even go further than that and say he's not even meaning what he's saying here. He's just doing what people would do in ancient times. They would begin their letters as Paul begins this letter. And as we read these verses, whilst there are important elements to it that are characteristic of how people would write at the time, I just want to encourage you not to miss out on the deep theological truth that we find within this greeting. I found it a lot harder to, to prepare a sermon on two verses rather than maybe 10, 15, 20. But it's been fascinating the more and more I've dug deep in these two simple sentences, the more and more I've found something of Paul's heart for the Ephesian church and something of what God wants to communicate to us today. Without question for the Apostle Paul, this was hello. He was saying hello in these first two verses, but it was more than a simple hello and we know this for three important reasons that become clear in the text as we dig a little deeper. And as we do this this morning, there is so much for us to then take and apply uh, to our lives. So I'm going to just give you three reasons why this was more than a simple hello. Uh, and the first reason is this. The Apostle Paul was more than just saying hello because of what he said about himself in verse 1. Let's take a moment to look at the first part of verse 1. The opening words to the church in Ephesus, we read this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. There are three things I want us to see from this one line. So we're getting value for money this morning when it comes to our exegesis, when it comes to us unpacking what God's word says. Firstly, focus on Paul's name. He's called... Paul, he used to be called Saul. Who was Saul? Saul was the first ever king that God appointed to rule over his people in the Old Testament. And the truth of the matter is, Saul failed. Saul was vain. Saul was arrogant. He was a king who fell short and who paid the price for his faithlessness. But he still carried deep respect amongst the people of God, including in the time of Jesus. Why else would Paul's parents name him Saul to begin with? To be named Saul was to be associated with royalty. People named their children in ancient times out of a desire to see something virtuous come out of their lives. And Saul would have been named Saul because the aspiration from his parents would have been one of seeing him fulfill a position of authority, of stature, of influence something which he did in fact achieve as a Pharisee. But when he encounters Jesus, his life is transformed and he's named Paul. And Paul means small. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Paul means small. So when Paul begins his letter, he essentially says, I'm Paul. And what he's saying here is, I'm insignificant. I'm nothing. Compared to Christ and apart from Christ, I am unworthy. 
So there's a lot going on. When Paul changes, when Paul's name is changed from Saul to Paul, there's actually a really important theological point here. He's saying, I'm nothing. I'm insignificant. Compared to him, I'm unworthy. And we know that's true because of what we read in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. Paul didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose Paul. His grace towards him was literally irresistible. So, first thing to hold on to is Paul's name. Secondly, Paul describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle literally means sent one. And God had chosen 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, as a foundation for his church to flourish and grow. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9.1, it should be up on the screen. Uh, Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? This is one of the characteristics of the 12, of the 12's apostleship. Uh, they could bear living testimony to the risen Jesus. They had seen the risen Jesus for themselves. The disciples could say they had seen the Lord and so could Paul because because of his encounter on the road to Damascus. Now this apostleship was unique and that through the power of God's spirit, um, God was at work through these apostles to start the church and to lead the church. But as we will see later on in the book of Ephesians and as we see at different points in the New Testament and church history, they were also those who carried apostolic qualities, apostolic gifting. And they carried this known that they were distinct, they were different from the original 12 apostles and Paul because they had a unique role to establish God, God's church in the world. So the apostles, the second thing I wanted to focus on in that first sentence in verses 1 to 2. And finally, I want us to look at the relationship of Paul's apostleship to Jesus because he describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. He's an apostle of Christ by God's will. The reason why Paul is an apostle is for Jesus. It's so that Christ's purpose can be fulfilled in and through Paul. Paul is an apostle who belongs to Jesus. And the reason why Paul is an apostle is because, again, Jesus chose him. He wanted him to be an apostle. He saved him and he gave him a particular purpose. And I think for all of us this morning, we all need to hold on to that. God has saved you. Praise God. He has saved you. And he has worked in your life so that you have moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the son that he loves. But God in Christ, he has also purposed you. He has a plan for you. And he wants to work through you so that he is glorified through you as you fulfill your purpose, your God-given purpose. So he has saved Paul and purposed Paul. And he has saved every single one of us if we have faith in Christ today. And he has purposed Every single one of us. So Paul is communicating all of that in his first sentence in the book of Ephesians. And it leaves me asking a question this morning. When was the last time you said hello like that? Um, not that we should say hello like that, by the way, but maybe it depends on our context. But I want us to understand this is way more than just, all right, how's things? Paul is pa he's packing a lot in this first sentence to really help the Ephesians understand and to help us understand something of what God is doing in his life and how that can encourage the believers in Ephesus. And this brings us on to the second reason why this is more than just hello. It's because of what he said about the Ephesians. And let's have a look at the second part of verse 1. Uh, Paul writes, To the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, so how does he describe these Ephesians? He describes them as, as what? As faithful and as saints. So the term saint simply means holy one, set apart, consecrated by God. And it would have been blasphemous for the Jews of Paul's day to hear the term saint applied to pagan men and women in the church in Ephesus. This would have been utterly outrageous for them. But 
But by the grace of God, these men and women in Ephesus, they are saints. They are saints. Not by any other measure, not performance, not position, not people group. By the grace of God, they were saints because of the grace of God. And by the grace of God, we are saints. We are saints because of his grace. It's our primary identity. Our primary identity in the Christian life is one of saint. Paul consistently communicates this to every, almost every church that he writes to, to the saints, to the saints, to the saints. And it's, it's the identity that we must live our lives from day after day. You will not break free from habitual sin. That habitual sin that you constantly find yourself going back to again and again and again until you realize who you are in Christ and what it is that Christ has given you and what you can do for Christ as you live in Christ and as you are, in, as you are empowered by Christ day after day. Now, this doesn't remove the fact that we're sinners. We are sinners. We fall short in various ways. That's absolutely true. But when it comes to living for Christ, we rest in our position as saints. It's our primary identity. Because Paul constantly, consistently rests in that position for himself and to the churches that he writes to. So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old sinful way, sinful life is gone. The new way has come. You're a saint, Denison Baptist Church. We are saints collectively. Amen? And as Paul says here, these Ephesians were a collection of saints who were in Christ Jesus, and it was only because they were in Christ Jesus that they could designate themselves as saints. I think sometimes we get a wee bit nervous about that word saint, because we think it's down to me, or we, we think that we're being prideful in some way, but it's nothing to do with us. We're designated saints because of Christ, not because of us. And Paul here describes them as a particular type of saint. He says they're faithful saints. So they're faithful saints. And that term faithful simply means a people who were active in their faith. A people who believed in their faith. They put into practice what they said was true. So they, they verbalized something and then they lived it out day after day. The city of Ephesus could look at them and say with confidence, these guys follow through with what they say. They are consistent with their words and their actions. It wasn't just a collection of ideas that they had about themselves because of Jesus. These ideas were reflected in the lives they lived in the city they found themselves in, a city marked by money and idolatry. And the final thing, the final thing to mention from what Paul says about these Ephesians is that he reminds them of where they are to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. This is where they are. They don't need to know that, but he does remind them of that. They are at Ephesus. Paul wants them to understand this is your mission field. This is where you've been called to. The people you live amongst are the people you have been called to day after day. And as God used believers in their lives to bring them to, bring them to a knowledge of Christ, God will also use them to bring others to a knowledge of him as very main faithful saints in the city of Ephesus. The power of presence. The power of presence. You know, how do we expect non-believers to come to saving faith in Christ if we're not with them day after day? If we're not spending time with non-believers? If we're not going to the places that non-believers are at? Now often, that's the natural places that you find yourself spending time with when it comes to engaging and connecting with non-believers, your neighborhood, your work, social circles, family, community spaces. But on other occasions, it's something that God is leading you towards. Maybe it's something or somewhere that God is calling you to, a particular people group or area. And I'm already aware of, of examples within the life of this church where God is doing that, in Denison and Ridry and beyond. There are people in this church who are connecting with this community in various ways. And perhaps this morning you're asking the question, how can I be more effective when it comes to being amongst 
non-believers and do speak to me after our time. I would love to chat with you because there's so many options for you. There's so many opportunities for us to connect with non-believers, both in Deniston and Ridbury and even beyond. So there's tremendous opportunity. There's great opportunity in Ephesus and there's great opportunity here because there's so many people who are far from Christ. As the Apostle Paul addresses these believers, as the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, I wonder, what would you put after that at? And who is it that God is calling you to today? Where is the place? Who are the people that God is calling you to? So again, let me ask the question this morning. When was the last time you said hello like that? What a challenge. What a challenge. I don't think any of us say hello like that. I recognize that. And that's because Paul was speaking to this church and it was God's word speaking to us. Finally, we know this is more than just a simple hello from Paul uh, because of what he says about God. Uh, and I want us to look at what it is the Apostle Paul says in verse 2 of our passage. We read this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And what does Paul tell us about God here in this passage? Well, he tells us that God is three persons and one God. Because the grace and peace that we have in the Christian life comes from God the Father, through God the Son, and through God the Spirit, dwelling within us, making that a reality day after day. And we see how important this was to Paul. Paul uses this exact phrase in seven other places in the New Testament. So verse 2 can be found in seven other locations in the New Testament. Romans 1.7 1 Corinthians 1 3, 2 Corinthians 1 2, Galatians 1 3, Philippians 1 2, 2 Thessalonians 1 2, and Philemon 3. Now, the Greeks would often begin a letter with the word greetings, and the Jews would often begin a letter with the word peace. So, when Paul uses grace and peace in his letter, grace is another form of greeting. What Paul is doing is here is combining the two and he's communicating that God has opened the door for both Greek and Jew to be made right with him. It's fascinating. And Paul's point from the very beginning of his letter is that God has chosen to bless every single person with grace and peace. Every one of us. It doesn't matter what nationality we are. It doesn't matter our social status. It doesn't matter our life circumstance. God has chosen to bless everyone with grace and peace if we choose to respond to him. And it's something that he wanted to do because he loves us and he cares for us and he demonstrates that by dying on the cross for us. It's not something that we could have achieved for ourselves. That word grace literally means undeserved merit. God showed us his favor. God's grace is what marks Denison Baptist Church. It's what defines us as followers of Jesus. We couldn't have came up with this for ourselves. None of us wanted to pursue a relationship with God. God chose this for us. And we need to understand this morning that the order is also important. Uh, we cannot experience the peace of God until we first come to terms with the grace of God. So it's not peace and grace. It's never peace, then grace. It's always grace, then peace. The grace of God paves the way for the peace of God. And God the Father and God the Son are the source of this grace and peace. A grace and peace that's experienced by God the Spirit. The Trinity, the Trinity is at work in this whole equation of grace and peace. And that's your testimony, is it not? Is that your testimony? That's your testimony. The grace of God in your life, it brought you to that place where from your heart you cried out, Jesus is Lord. God's grace caused you to confess Christ is Lord. And what followed from that grace was an experience, the peace of God in your life, a peace that surpassed all understanding, a peace that can often remain consistent whilst our lives are inconsistent, a peace which helps us in the midst of some really difficult moments. That's our testimony, grace and peace, grace and peace. And for many of us, that moment of grace was perhaps a long time ago. Maybe we're, we're struggling to remember 
precisely what it felt like to come to, to faith in Christ. That the peace of God is testimony that the grace of God was a reality. That yes, there was this moment where, where God worked in our life and changed us and transformed us. That the two are connected. Our peace that we experience today is a reminder that God's grace was and is sufficient for us. Uh, a few weeks ago, I heard a testimony of, of a lady called Aya and Hirsi Ali. Um, you might have, have heard of this story, but she was one of the most well-known and well-respected uh, atheist intellectuals of her day. She's good friends with, with Richard Dawkins. And she published an article in Unheard in November explaining why she was no longer an atheist and why she was now a Christian. Uh, she gave a, a verbal testimony of how as she was brought to that place where she knew firsthand the grace of God, then the peace of God that she experienced day after day. And it began during a, during a time in her life when she was, she was filled with so much dread and fear uh, and worry. She was overwhelmed constantly by these negative emotions and she couldn't she didn't have any answer. She couldn't explain why this was happening to her. There was nothing bad going on in her life, but yet she still experienced this lack of peace. Uh, she felt like she was having a breakdown. Uh, and so she hired the very best therapists and doctors to help her overcome this because she didn't have any explanation for what was going on. And none of them seemed to help. Uh, and none of them seemed to have any answers as to what was going on. And it all came to a head when she spoke with one of our therapists. And as they asked question after question, she was given answer after answer. Nothing was shifting. The fear, the anxiety, the dread was refusing to move in her heart and in her mind. And the therapist, who wasn't a Christian, interestingly, responded by saying, it sounds to me like you're spiritually bankrupt. And the therapist then asked her, describe to me what your experience with religion has been like and tell me how it is you understand God. And Ayan, who grew up as a Muslim, uh, went on to describe to this therapist how it is that she had understood God. And she went on to describe how the God she knew hated women. Uh, the God she knew was an oppressor, was vengeful, uh, was... By definition, darkness, he demanded reverence uh, and rule keeping at all costs. And if the, the rules weren't kept, punishment followed. And the therapist listened to this and then asked her, if you were to make a God of your imagination, tell me what they would look like. And so she started to describe to her therapist all the things that she would like God to be if God did actually exist. And the more and more she described this God to this therapist, the more and more she realized she was describing Jesus. And that moment started something. <clears throat> it started something in Ian's life. And it led to the grace of God being at work in her life. And God started to, to shower his love upon her. And what followed from that, that moment of grace was peace, deep, deep peace. The fear, the worry, the anxiety, the dread, the confusion, all of it went, all of it disappeared. Because she knew who she was. She knew who she belonged to. She, wor she worshipped Jesus. And that made all the difference. Began with grace. It led to peace. And Ian's testimony is no different to any one of our testimonies. We have all moved from darkness to light. Amen. And this morning, I just want to invite you, if you haven't done that, if you haven't made a decision to receive Jesus, what it is we've spoken about in these first two verses in Ephesians, you can do that. You can receive his grace. You can experience his peace. Do that today. Trust in him. And if you would like prayer for that, then do speak with myself or TJ or with someone you know who is here today who loves the Lord. 
and we would love to chat with you and talk with you about what it means to follow him. This morning, we're now going to remove into we're going to move into a moment of response. And let me just say, if, if you would like prayer for anything that's going on in your life, I've spoken a, for a short time there about worry and dread and anxiety and fear. And I recognise that maybe that's an unspoken reality in your life. Maybe you're you're going through something right now that that you just find difficult to shift, and you don't know what to do about that. Then again, do speak to us. This is a space where you can be prayed for uh, this time. So as we have tea and coffee, we can pray for you, whether it be here or somewhere else in this building. I know it's not a big building, but it may be for healing. It may be a situation you're in the middle of. It may be a decision you have to make. Do speak with us. We want to pray for you. Uh, This morning, we're also going to respond by coming to the table because this table represents why as we have grace and peace. We come to this table recognizing that there but for the grace of God, we can come and we can take this bread and we can drink this cup. And as we do so, we can recognize that Jesus is Lord of our lives. This table is for anyone who professes faith in him. And for anyone who's not sure, for anyone who's still on a journey of faith, uh, we would invite you not to come to the table, but just to observe. And to pray and ask that God would just continue to to work in your life. It was on the night in which he was betrayed. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. And in the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. So this Sunday we take this bread and we drink this cup. And we say thank you Jesus that, that I've been welcomed into your family. I'm reconciled. Thank you, Lord. The brothers and sisters who sit beside me have been reconciled. And today we rejoice that we are one with Christ and one with one another. Praise God for that. So let's pray. We're going to respond now and worship. (laughs) Father, we, we thank you for your word. And we pray that as we have thought about these first two verses, that you would continue to work in and through us. Lord, help us just to to have this reality of grace and peace continue on, not just today, but throughout this week. Lord, I pray that we would remember that moment where we did confess you as Lord. And as we remember that moment, and as we remember what you've done for us, it would cultivate a life of peace. A life that results in us being able to also share that peace with those who are perhaps lacking peace and who are far from you. So we ask that you bless us now as we respond and worship. Go before us, Lord. Help us to know you and help us to see you. Help us to respond in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ 
Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the crown his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose. Again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me is love vast as the ocean loving kindness as a flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who his love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy Float a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured incessant from above Heaven's peace and perfect justice Kills the guilty world in love Let me all thy love accepting, love thee ever all my days. Let me seek thy kingdom only, and my life be to thy praise. Thou alone shalt be my glory, nothing in the world I see. Thou hast cleansed and sanctified me. Thou thyself hast set me free. Thou 
No love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love, just confess that. No love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom shed for us. His precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day. is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher, no love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer, no love is higher. No love is wider, no love is deeper, no love is truer. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Not even death itself, not sickness, not famine, not war, not disease, not suffering, not guilt or shame. The love of Christ knows no end. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, far as east from the west, so far as he removed your sin, this is the love of Christ. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide, through the floodgates of God's mercy, Float a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in Thank you, Lord, for that truth today. Thank you for reconciliation that we have. Thank you that we did not choose you, but you chose us. Your mercy is great. Your peace is great. Your grace is great. Thank you for that identity as saints, faithful saints. Help us to walk in that identity this week. Not to go back to old ways, not to run back to broken things, but let us live in faithfulness that is found in Christ Jesus this week. Send us out now, Lord. We ask, we pray. In Jesus' name, we sing all these things.